Welcome to Push Go, a podcast presented by Plum, where we highlight the defining moments that impact how we live and work. Uh, today, I'm joined by Carter Malloy. He's the founder and CEO of Acre Trader. Now, Carter grew up in an Arkansas farming family, and he's had a lifelong passion for agriculture and investing. Today, you're going to hear how a conversation about cryptocurrency with his dad led to combining those passions to build Acre Trader. Carter, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Rick. Man, glad to have you. You know, I think you might be the very first physics grad I've had on the podcast. A lot of financial guys, econ, but physics. But what what took you down the path of physics? I liked it. I, I don't yeah. know how to say that better. It was in school, and um, I was actually I hopped around from biology to I wanted to be pre med to business school, which I hated accounting. I got a bad grade. Uh, and I just, just enjoyed the subject matter, enjoyed problem solving. Wow. Wow. And so what I think of, you know, people's backgrounds of getting in, obviously it's a lot of relationships, engagement, uh, but you started out a couple of jobs out of school, but you pretty quickly went into the financial world. So kind of bridge for, especially people that are thinking about, I've got a degree in this, I guess I've got to go back to school and get another degree before I enter into the world of finance. That wasn't the case for you. So talk to a little bit about how you got into it. Was Stevens your first foray into the financial world? It was my, my first, uh, I guess, real job. I worked you know, in high school and college. Yeah. And post-school had some businesses. So yeah, it yeah. was, uh, for better or worse, grew up in an entrepreneurial family. Uh-huh. And so that's one of the reasons I did my degrees. I was like, well, I'll never work for anyone. I'm always only going to work for myself. Duh. Yeah. Uh, so I'll study whatever I want and, and have a good time. And... Uh, so after, after school, I uh, basically had a, had a couple of small businesses, and then you're, you're right, got a got an interview, and I, I even then thought, now nah, there's no way they're going to want me, and, uh, and ended up strapping on a necktie and working there for seven years, and loved it. Uh, so you said your parents were entrepreneurs, your father, so but they were entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs in the agricultural world. Speak to that a little bit, kind of what that really meant to you growing up, and when you looked at that, what it really really kind of played out for you. My dad was a uh, farmer, farmland owner, and also entrepreneur and like 10 other things as, yeah. as was my mom. And my mom's actually in the candy business. So there's definitely uh, booms and busts associated with both being an entrepreneur uh, and, and being in, in ag. Yeah. And did they let you play around in that? Were, were you like forced to do work for them or did they kind of encourage you as you were, cause you said, okay, I, I dabbled in a few things in elementary high school. Were you also the serial entrepreneur with them or did you work with them on their businesses? Oh yeah, they got plenty of child labor out of me. Uh, that's, I think that's why I took the other job so I wouldn't have to work for them. <laughs> oh, that's so so good. And so for for many people that are listening here, it's uh you know we always look back at our, our parents and there's pluses or minuses in there. And uh, so it sounds like, and again we've talked a little bit about this before, that upbringing really did kind of drive you to be the person you are today. Looking at the entrepreneurial piece, how they worked, the the engagement there. So let's speak to that a, a little bit because you said you, you kind of went into the to the Stevens world, but you knew you had this bug. So were you kind of setting that aside for a while while you went into the job with a tie? Or is this one of those that you were still on the side, still trying to figure out what that entrepreneurial thing was going to be? Oh, I was absolutely setting it aside. It's like, oh, I'll be right back. I'll be an entrepreneur, you know, here in a year, two years, whatever. I always, always wanted to build a business or businesses. And, and so... My, my thinking at the time of going into research and into equities was the ability to get paid to study big businesses was was really appealing to me uh, to understand the mechanics of, of companies uh, as I didn't have that formal education uh, to, to begin with. Mm-hmm. So I really in, enjoyed, it's been a dozen years ultimately in, in equities, uh, both sell side and, and buy side, and really, really loved that research process. But yeah, the whole time was making business, crappy business plans, but Lots of them, right? And and planning all along uh, to, to hopefully someday build something. Yeah, yeah. I had uh, friends of mine that were uh, kind of went down a similar route, and they they talked about the more they did research and the more they engaged other companies, the better prepared they felt for that eventual launch on their own, because they were learning vicariously through these other entities in front of them. 
Uh, can you think of any of those that kind of was a light bulb for you or one of those like, my goodness, I'm glad I saw this happen. I'll never make that mistake. Did you have any of those kind of, you know, instances you could bring up to us? C- certainly both. Um, you know, one is being fortunate enough to be engaged with management teams of much larger companies at a, at a fairly young age. Uh, I, I quickly learned the types of the type of manager I would like to be and the type of manager I would not like to be. Okay. Uh, and there's, there's a whole spectrum of folks and the way they run businesses. And it's not necessarily that one is entirely incorrect or the entire the other way is, is very correct. Mm-hmm. It's stylistic. Uh, but I, I, I learned a lot, you know, in, in dealing with a lot of public company CEOs, you, you learn a lot about hubris. You learn a lot you know, about, <laughs> about some folks have a little too much swagger uh, and, and a little too much confidence. And so as, as part of my career, I, you know, would invest in businesses going either direction up or down. So I was actually pretty lucky to be a uh, to be a student of, of failures and to understand what what can hurt businesses. Uh, inversely, definitely learned that businesses that own information are more valuable. They're they're more enduring. And well, I think for us as a company, we invest in that early. Right, most early stage companies are it's all about growth and that's it. And we've, we've if anything invested too heavily so far in building uh, the, the things that make us an enduring company. The, the the information underneath our business to build a moat and a competitive uh, barrier around us. I, I, lo- I love that for the, for the entrepreneur out there saying, okay, I, I've got to hit ARR, I've got to hit MRR, I've got to grow, 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 grow. But I love that concept of information, infrastructure, kind of your own unique IP that makes you enduring. Um, I can see where in the craziness of growth, you can completely forget about that. And it's, it, to your point, in many cases, it is the reason why people are investing in you because of the unique IP and piece that's, that's there that they really want to invest in. That's just really interesting. Thanks. We're, we're, we're pretty excited about it. We're still early, but we're, we're building as fast as we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, like, like many people that are talking about the entrepreneurial world here, uh, you know, you obviously are overnight success, happened in probably two or three months, and just boom, it hit. You had this idea, you just launched, and you're done, right? It was so easy to kind of, you know, go down this path. But uh, in the investment world, you know, both – locally here on the coast, as you start looking at that, that growth machine in your career, uh, you had to have a ton of folks whispering in your ear saying, stay this track, stay the partner track. This is what you could do. This is really where your skill set is. You're a great researcher. We love what you're doing. So as you began to think about doing something different, did you have anyone come alongside encouraging you to, to step outside of the career path or were most of the folks saying, stay here, stay here. This is where you should be. Most everyone said that. Uh, the the exception would be my wife, who was wildly supportive. And you know, for both of my major career changes, one is uh, moving to the West Coast and joining a, a, a startup fund that had not yet launched, um, and then coming here to back to Fayetteville to start a company. In both cases, I took monster pay cuts, right? Yeah. And and uh, the second time we had we had children, uh, but I, I am I am uh, supported by and partnered with the most amazing woman in the world. And she didn't care. She's like, "Look, this is what you want to do. You're going to be happy. Uh, your your risk on. So am I. We're going to be. We're going to have a good time no matter what. So let's go for it and swing for the fences." Well, so having a you know life partner like that that really comes alongside you that says we really can swing for the fence. Obviously, tremendous support that's there. Um, but let's talk about the idea because we'll, we'll talk about Acre Trader here in a second. But it didn't just show up as Acre Trader overnight, obviously. Uh, but you had a your family had a background in agricultural and farming. You obviously had seen all from the investment side. You knew what worked, what didn't work. How did you begin to meld those two together? And I'd love to hear the story of the seed that was planted that then became Acre Trader. So, and I've heard the story before. But I'd love to hear that story again on the the trip where you were, kind of how it came about. So I. In the background of being a professional equity investor, I was an entirely non-professional land investor. So I'd been buying and selling farmland and, and doing some of that with my dad. And dad's, you know, my, my best friend. We talk, we talk most days on the phone. Oh, you're blessed, and man. That's great. Yeah, I'm, I'm very lucky. We, uh, we've kicked around a lot of bad business ideas over the years, a, a lot of them. And... Uh, we, we were just really excited about land. I just really wanted to do more of it. And we started exploring the idea of, do you go launch another fund? And it's like, yeah, it's not as scalable and uh, not that impactful. And I'm already in a, in a, 
a, a great fund, right? I don't want to go do this again. Um, and, and so we started playing around with the idea of how we could allow other people to invest in land. And, you know, started talking about the securities world and, and securitization. And my dad, who's, who's 89 today, was, you know, whatever, 86, uh, I'm sorry, 84 at the time. He was pushing me. He's like, you know, we should really look at tokenization. And I was like, no, man, that is a dumb trend. You know, mind you, if I tokenized it, I'd probably be on a yacht somewhere. Now, but hold um, on now. Remember, this is your 84-year-old father talking to the 30-something-year-old son telling you you should lean in and do – that's big. That's that's correct. And um, actually, to, to back up a little bit, the, the initial suggestion – actually, the, the genesis of the conversation – around land is he was saying, Hey, I want to buy some Bitcoin. Again, this is like 2017, right? You're like, like, dad. You mor-. No, I told him he was an idiot. I was like, you moron. It's like $800 for air. I can't believe you would think about this. Oh, I'm so disappointed good. in you. You know, and of course, like, oh my gosh, how, how incredibly wrong I was. Do not take uh, uh, cryptocurrency investment advice from me. Uh, so, you know, he, he started pushing this theme of, what, you know, man, I wish we could do the same thing with a hard asset like land. And I, I remember where I was in uh, was the time I was driving, you know, pulled over. It's like, hang on, this is this is actually something. This idea of fractionalizing land and allowing individual investors. I had friends all over the place that were like, hey, I want to invest in land. I'd like to put in some money. I don't want to go out and buy a multi million dollar parcel, but I, I'm really fascinated by this. And to that point, if you wanted to buy land, you had to go out to a county you've never been to, probably plop down a million dollars. Mm-hmm. Hire a farmer, and congratulations! Now you get to be a you know you get to manage a farm. Right, it's just a, a non-starter for most people you and I have ever met. Uh, so, so this was really a all right. There's this interesting investment product in a world with information asymmetry that's pretty wild. So favorable to the educated investor, uh, and and here's this real market need. Pe- people want alternatives in their in their portfolio. They want to invest in things other than cryptocurrencies. Thank goodness, uh, and and stocks and bonds. So, so I love that. Uh, I remember the uh, one of the very first investment books I read back in the day. I think it was One Up on Wall Street by Peter Lynch. That's one of those classic, classic. And and the the whole nuance, every chapter seemed like every other page was invest in what you know, invest in what you know, invest in what you know. And here you guys have this perfect storm. You grew up, understood farming. You understood that. You're coming in from the a fund standpoint. You understood that. And you've got a you know, business partner, a life partner, and your dad saying, hey, here's what we could go do. So you really are mixing the best of both worlds, a technology, understanding what you needed to do with this thing you understood over here. And now you're sitting on the side of the road. Are you a moleskin guy? Did you pull that out? Or did you just say, stop, we need to talk about this? I mean, are you writing things down as fast as you can? I mean, but tell me about that moment. Uh, probably, you know, uh, notes on an iPhone is what I, I usually email myself. Okay. I've gotten a little better in Google Docs, but but that's a general way to, at the time that I was keeping notes. So uh, I was just take, yeah, I took some notes on iPhone. And then I'm a very visual person. I, I love PowerPoint. This is a gross thing to say out loud, but I, I just, I, I really, enjoy, I, I need concepts to be able to, you need to be able to break them down, explain them with crayons. And, yeah. and for me, PowerPoint is an incredible way to do that. Uh, so I, I spent the next uh, weeks, right, of, of real late nights uh, working on this. Yeah, my, my, we had our second uh, young baby at home and, and I had an intense day job. So it was, but it was like the most exciting that I felt in a, in a long time. And, and mind you, I've made a bunch of these business plans in my career and I would take them to friends and challenge them and try to think of the downsides and uh, every time ultimately put a bullet in those plans. And this time I put it together and then I uh, spoke with some attorneys like, can we do this? They, they gave it the green light and started putting it in front of friends that I knew were highly cynical. Uh, and same thing. Everybody's like, this is, this is really interesting. You should pursue it. So. Yeah. So I love that concept as well as I tell a lot of entrepreneurs that, or at least want to be entrepreneurs that just because your mom, your brother, your best friend, and the guy that you play basketball with tells you it's a great idea. Those are the wrong people to talk to. You've <laughs> got to go find people that are not afraid to hurt your feelings. They can really tell you kind of roll their eyes and say, yeah, you know, is, d- this doesn't make sense. That's fantastic. But at that point, you're you've got this career you're going down this path. You got a bunch of naysayers saying, "Really, Carter? I mean, this is what you're thinking about doing." Uh, you're working the crayon magic, and again, I'm a PowerPoint guy. Don't apologize for it. I'm, I'm a visual learner, so I, it's, I'm a whiteboard guy. If I can whiteboard it, put it on a PowerPoint, it's great. 
So you start doing the nights and weekends while you're staying up with the baby to, to make all this thing work. At what point in time did you push go? Hence the, like the podcast push go. Did it take a month? Was it six months? At what point in time did you say, I'm ready? Cause it sounds like in your heart and your gut and your wife and your dad, they're like, this is such a big idea. And you knew it. But, but when did you really decide to move forward on it? How long did it take? And what was that process like? Probably three months. Okay. If I'm, if I'm recalling correctly. You know, three months from, hey, this is really interesting to walking in and quitting or, or walking in and I, um, I was a partner with some folks. And so walked in, I go tell them, hey, I'm going to, I want to go pursue this other thing. And I, I wanted to fulfill some duties. So I actually stayed part time with them for, uh, for a number of months after that. But yeah, that was, that was the, uh, one of the most nervous days of my life I was fit, like hands were physically shaking. Uh, wow. Like, I, I'm, I have to commit to this. I've committed. I have to do it. Yeah. Because, you know. Prior to that, you are looking at these individuals and you committed to be a partner and to go drive something. So it's, it's not really quitting to your point. It really, you have to, you have to undo, you have to really kind of back away. And hopefully if the relationship's right, people get it. They may not be happy, but they, they get where you're going. So you're feeling pretty confident there. So now that you've made that decision, you're helping them out. You've got this thing in front of you. Uh, did you go spend the next three weeks coming up with a great logo call it acre trader or, or is this one of those that that came to you instantly and you're ready to go so how did the name come to be i created an excel sheet and i started going through uh google domains and just looking for every potentially available domain name and i, I really liked the name acre trade or acre trader and uh, I had about 50 other names and some of them I've, I've since shared that sheet with one person in, in, <laughs> internally and they still make fun of me to this day. Uh, so I'm not sharing with anybody else. I think it's Lizzo. It no, some, no, but because you have to, right? It had some terrible names in it. Uh, ultimately, and I, I'm, I'm sort of a spendthrift and in probably the wrong places sometimes. So as an example, I got our logo design, the, the one we use today that's on my, on my jacket right here uh, for either 15 or $18 on, on Fiverr. So the, uh, but the domain name was like 1200 bucks. And I was, I mean, I was so, so close to going with one of the cheap domain names that was kind of a bad name for the business and ultimately decided I'm going to pony up and, and buy the domain name. And I'm very, very glad that I did. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you've read the book Shoe Dog and what, what did he pay for the Nike swoosh? Was it like 40 bucks? I mean, it was just one of those, got a friend to design, put it together and it's this iconic image. So yeah, it doesn't require, you know, X to do that. So now you're making that decision. You've got it. You've got the cool logo. You're ready to make things happen. Um, how did you begin to build the team? Because this wasn't obviously, you, you knew because you had been around enough companies, this wasn't going to be you as an individual figuring this out. You had to build infrastructure around. And I want you to take that conversation along with the angel funding or how funding began for you. So how did you begin the infrastructure or the nucleus of a team? And when did you start looking for funding? So I, I initially funded it out of pocket. So I was, I was fortunate enough to have built some savings. So uh, the, the first thing that I had to do was go get an MVP. So prior to actually pursuing the business, I was telling you, I challenged, uh, had friends challenge me and I always asked for critical feedback. Uh, I also ran a number of surveys. So uh, Google surveys, SurveyMonkey, just trying to find the target audience for, that would use this product and asking them some pointed questions around were they familiar with farmland, would they be interested in investing in it, uh, would they let me contact them to ask them yeah. more questions. And, and so I just did a number of user interviews that way and, and, and formally like trying to actually gather statistics to make sure that I wanted to build the MVP. And so this is still you on your own. This is just Carter in a yeah. room. That's correct. That, okay. That's actually prior to leaving my job, right? Okay. That was like, I got to make sure there's, there's product market fit here yeah. to the best that I can. Uh, so then post leaving, I uh, went to go hire a, a technologist, wanted to start actually to build an MVP very quickly, a uh, minimum viable product to, to get that online and, mm -hmm. uh, and actually really vet that that consumer demand was there. So uh, similar to the domain names, like, all right, how can I be methodical? Went to 50 fintech companies and investment technology companies and put them in a spreadsheet and then went through as like, all right, what are my favorite 10 or 20 of these? Uh, contacted all of their CTOs, had a product development to which, you know, the majority of them rightfully like scoffed or laughed or did not respond at all. Yeah. Do you know how busy and, uh, I am? One, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, one guy named Vlad, I, I did enter, end up interviewing several of them, 
Uh, one of them is a guy named Vlad, uh, a Ukrainian fellow, just an awesome human being. And we got along very well and we still work together to this day. Uh, so Vlad, oh, so cool. Vlad be- became our product lead and, and began to build all the technology. After that, we got the MVP live and there was real interest. People, mm-hmm. at least they will get to uh, the difference between saying I'm interested and in giving you money in, in a little bit, mm-hmm. but at least we're very interested up front. And so uh, went went ahead and made another uh, key hire or two that included our, our current uh, COO, Garrett McClinic, who is... Uh, like I, I would call him a best friend and certainly a partner in the business, uh, if anything, a, a co-founder in the business. Uh, and then a marketing person named Harrison Hollingsworth. So those two guys here in Fayetteville, Arkansas, those those two folks joined. And uh, then we went out to go try, try to raise money. And that's probably another podcast, but uh, it took a lot longer than we thought it would. Right, right. Was it that had the When we were raising, I remember one person telling me is that you always want to raise money when you don't need it. That's right. <laughs> because when you need it, then the pressure and the timing. So that's great. But, but to your point, another podcast for another day. So you get this nucleus of a team. You're kind of building that. Um, again, self-funding is fantastic. Uh, you know, we when we started our company, we had the opportunity of uh, having some oppor- opportunity to take a package from a company. So it was uh, myself, two other P&G guys, you know, Henry Ho, also my wife. And we all had packages. And we use PNG Procter and Gamble money as our angel money because they had no strings attached. And so people were like, how'd you get started? You know, did you have like 20 people give you money? It's like, no, no, we took this package. We didn't go spend six months traveling the world. We took that and invested. So it's great. You have some cash to make that happen. So now you're feeling it. And, and I remember um, it was Dr. Stephen Gray, Steve Gray's that told me this is that the, the best advice he would ever give an entrepreneur, which is what I want to segue in for you is that, uh, you may think you've got a great idea, but you are only as good as you invoice and collect. Just because someone says they think the idea is good, if someone says they're going to buy it from you, and they do the free trial, and they play around with it, you're only as good as you invoice and collect. So let's, let's talk about those first few customers outside of some friends and cousins and people that bought in and you know kind of ran some water through the system. When did you realize that you had what you needed for people to actually say yes to go buy something? What, what did it take to get to that truly that first customer? So that was a pretty monstrous moment for us, right? So we went out and, and first we were raising capital for the business. And that was actually, by this point, call it early 19, okay. trending pretty positively. Uh, so so we, were, we had raised a decent amount of capital. I'm like, all right, we're in business for the next year. You know, even if it's just like this tiny team, yeah. we, we've, we can actually go try this out and go do some marketing. And all these folks that love the idea that signed up, you know, in surveys or in the MVP uh, or their friends, whatever people I knew, everyone loved the idea. Not a single one of them invested Crickets. in the actual business, like actually Crickets. buying farmland. And, you know, I, the, the call always went something like this. Oh, I love it. This is absolutely awesome. I, you know, and we're, we're a big ticket, right? So this is absolutely awesome. I, I really want to be involved in this. At the time, the investment minimum was like $1,000. Say okay, great. You can start with a thousand or ten thousand, and then the next thing was, yeah. R- remind me again, how long have you been in business? He was like <coughs> three months, <coughs> three months, <coughs> you know. <laughs> and and uh, folks, I think naturally got got very nervous. So it took it took actually um, a couple of months to get our first like real outside you know third party investor to come in and invest in farmland, and we were you know it was a pretty nerve wracking couple of months. Uh-huh. Again, incredibly encouraging conversations, and we knew hey, if we can get this flywheel to start moving, if we can just get it from right. zero to something that, that people will become comfortable, because trust is the huge barrier, right? So uh, ended up, uh, a guy calls us, and, and I answered, and he's like, oh, I know this is a small company when, when the customer service rep is the CEO, <laughs> but hey, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, from up north, and I really like this uh, farm you have on the website, and I want to invest. And uh, it, it was a farm that I personally owned and, and um, was invested in. He's like, yeah, it looks like there's like $100,000 left to inv- invest in this farm. I'll, I'll just take all of it. And, and, it and you moment, paused. You're like, what? It's almost threw up on my desk, you know, like uh, <laughs> <laughs> had it on speakerphone. The other folks in the office could hear it and like, uh, hung up the phone. And it was great. just this moment. Yeah, that, that was the moment of, oh, my gosh, there's there's real demand out there. And and. Uh, we're off. We're off and running. 
Oh, that's fantastic. Then, it's, it's, I love that, that moment. It's just, it's one of those where you, you, you put them on mute and you're all just dancing fast and you take them back off. Well, you know, I'll see if it's still a hundred. It might be less than that, but I'll, but I'll let you know, right. You exactly. had to play a little bit coy. That's fantastic. So that's 2019. I mean, that's in the entrepreneurial world. That's not decades ago. I mean, that's not that long ago. So that was that first real significant customer that you started to feel like I had some fit, you know, that classic problem market fit, the product, you got the product market fit, but you're not scaling yet. So let's kind of jump into the scaling part of it. When did you think, what, what, what decision did you make or what happened that you started to see a little bit of scaling because it happened pretty quick after that? It did. So, well, you know, it's the, um, like hurry up and wait. Right. So after that farm, it took us, um, we raised more money for the, for the business itself. So we, we ended up raising a, uh, about a $2 million seed round or a, a million and a half, call it about outside capital in a, in a seed round. And so, so, all right, now we're comfortable. We can probably go hire one more person, maybe two, and yeah. uh, maybe even run some more ads and, and continue building tech. Uh, so, and then we sold this farm. We're like, all right, great. We're off to the races. And then it took us another, our next farm was on the site for six months. And the one after that was on the site for three months. And then it became somewhat exponential from there uh, to, to where I got to a point where we had farms that would sell in six minutes. Six uh, minutes? Yeah. It's actually, it's actually a bad customer experience problem. Like that, that's too fast. We, yeah. we want farms to be on there for days or weeks so that people have choice and ability to come on. So, mm-hmm. so we actually uh, try to govern the demand a little bit on uh, certainly on the smaller, smaller investments that are on the site. Okay. Um, but yeah, it, it still, it still took a long time to, to get that real comfort and, and mojo underneath us of like, Hey, this is actually, we're, we've moved it from the idea phase. to This actually generates real revenue uh, and can, we can continue to, to hire and bring on more, uh, you know, bring on more folks and bring on more dollars. So now we're at that stage. It's kind of moving along. So, so give me a little 30 second clip on the conversation with your dad. When you said, dad, this is actually going to work. When, when did you finally say, kind of look side to side and say, dad, this is, it's working, man. So what was that like? I, you know, I'm not sure that I have said that yet. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Carter. Carter, yeah, you're, you're, you, you're, you're moving. It's every six minutes. Come on, you're moving along. So maybe you haven't said that yet. Uh, but but it, has, ha, it had to have been a cool, but it has to be kind of cool now to look back at your dad and say, Dad, is it hard to believe that three years ago, really four years ago, we had this idea and here's where we're going, and this is actually going to work. It's, it's got to be fulfilling. It's, it's incredibly fulfilling, and, it, and it's a fun conversation. Um, and in, in typical fashion of him and and maybe me is like, we, we immediately start looking forward, right? Like where, where is this in the next five years? What can we do to, to influence that? And I think we, we as a company view it the same way. We're, this is still day one, right? We're, we've got scars and gray hair from, from being here, uh, you know, and, and we've learned a lot, but, but again, we're, we're really just getting started. Love that. Love that. And so you, uh, let's kind of fast forward to where we are today. Cause we, I love folks to hear, cause if they want to buy into farmland, we're going to talk about that in a second, but you're no longer a, five, 10 person organization that's running on a couple of million dollars. You've had a very successful series B, right? Series B was your last raise successful series B. You're up well over a hundred people today. So you now are running a significant organization with significant investment dollars coming in. Obviously that's a different, that's a different world that you live in. It's only happened in the last year. So let's speak a little bit about where the company is today, what it looks like today. And then we'll jump into explaining truly how the model works a little bit and what acre trader looks like. So you, you hit the nail on the company today. We're well over a hundred employees and yes, it is far more uh, complex and difficult than, than it once was okay. uh, at least from a management standpoint. And we have built a, a number of really great products, you know, all those being really uh, in, inside of the worlds of FinTech and property technology. Okay. Uh, so financial technology for investing property technology to, do analytics and understand the land itself uh, to make sure that the, you know, to, to try to make sure that we're making good investments or that the investors on the website have access to the best information out there. Okay. So you're, you're, you're broadening to say we're more than just a place to look at real estate for like, if I think like realtor.com, it's more than just realtor.com. You look around, find something you like click and buy. It's more than that. So I love the financial side of it that comes along. So if someone's coming in, who is your ICP? Who's the type of person? Is it really just anyone that wants to invest in farmland? Or is this someone pretty specific? Who are you guys looking for in the ICP? 
T today it's an accredited investor. Uh, so that's a person that makes two or three hundred thousand dollars a year, or or meets a, a net worth threshold. Um, that's an SEC established guideline. Uh, right. You can also take tests. There, there's a number of ways to be an accredited investor in the U.S. So it's U.S. based accredited investors today. We would hope it up, hope to open it up to all U.S. based investors uh, at some point in the future. Okay. Okay. So that's kind of the, the focus there. And so give us some scale here. Are you going? selling 10 properties a month, a thousand properties a month, because it, I mean, farmland is finite, but it's still, it's, it's there. Uh, so, so what does that look like today as we think about just the, the volume of people that are coming in and kind of the, the farmland and what that looks like? It's, it's much closer to tens of properties, but you know, hundreds and, and thousands of, of people okay. uh, coming, coming through, the, coming through the, the platform each month. Uh, so smaller numbers, but it's big dollars, right? The, right. Rather than being a, Two hundred thousand dollar home. It's a two to five million dollar property each time. Okay. Okay. And that was really the original thesis of that's what it was going to look like. How do you get everyday, not everyday investors, be able to come in to own a piece of farmland that has the right financial viability and et cetera coming in? Okay. That's great. Correct. Great. So as you look at it today, give me a, a quick projection of the future because you said, hey, in five years you're already dreaming. Uh, is something you can tease us with a little bit, kind of whether it's a financial tool or something different that you've got coming out uh, over the next year or so? Kind of what's next? Yeah, so we've we've built this. We needed information to buy and sell land smarter. Uh, so we built a tool uh, with a, a pretty large engineering and, and data science crew. And it's called Acres. It lives today at acres.co. So acres.co. And we give that away to the market. Uh, the, the, there's a free version of it that's better than anything out there by, by perhaps an, an order of magnitude, uh, and it's free. And for us, the, the rationale is pretty simple. Our goal in that, that five years as a business uh, is we want to become the default platform for land transactions. Okay. So we want to help. Right now, we help people that are selling land, farmers that want to grow their business, and investors that want to want to invest in land. Uh, we, we see a very wide opportunity with, with all of those groups of folks to be the place people go to transact. Fantastic. Fantastic. So that's, that's the conversation I want to have in the other six months to a year. That's the next podcast for us. But I mean, we are running out of time now, but that's the next podcast. Uh, but if folks wanted to have that cup of coffee with you, or they really wanted to understand more about acre trader, kind of where things are going, uh, how do they get a hold of you? How do they engage? What does it look like? So we're, we are all over the internet is the great news. Uh, yeah. So acretrader.com is our website. There's just a, a load of information there. Uh, to learn from. Uh, certainly, I'm, I'm reachable, as is our company on, on LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, email us anytime. There's there's uh, contact information there, et cetera. But we'd, we'd love to hear from you. That's fantastic. So listen, Carter, I, I love a success story that includes your life partner over here, your wife, and your dad. Those things don't happen that often. It's a fantastic story. So uh, good luck to the future. Can't wait to talk again soon. And thanks for coming on today. Thank you so much, Rick. Thanks for listening to Push Go podcast highlighting the defining moments that impact how we live and work. It was great to have Carter on the show today. If you like what you heard, you can find more stories just like this on listen.plumshop.com. And hey, you wouldn't be mad if you left us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Now we have new episodes that drop every Wednesday. And if you're watching on YouTube, feel free to like and subscribe. Quick PS, the weekly segment where I give you a brief update on something happening at Plum. Now, you want to make the 2023 retail season as strong as Michael Jordan's career? We've got your starting lineup on the Plum Blog. Execution strategy, omni-channel marketing, data, analytics, literally everything you need to dominate your Jordan year. Check it out on blog.plumshop.com. And you can use the code PUSHGO, that's P-U-S-H-G-O, when you shop Plum for any $100 off any project.